concerning the notion of liberty and of moral agency by jonathan edwards this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the plain and obvious meaning of the words freedom and liberty in common speech is power opportunity or advantage that any one has to do as he pleases or in other words his being free from hindrance or impediment in the way of doing or conducting in any respect as he wills and the contrary to liberty whatever name we call that by is a person's being hindered or unable to conduct as he will or being necessitated to do otherwise if this which i have mentioned be the meaning of the word liberty in the ordinary use of language as i trust that none that has ever learned to talk and is unprejudiced will deny then it will follow that in propriety of speech neither liberty nor its contrary can properly be ascribed to any being or thing but that which has such a faculty power or property as is called will for that which is possessed of no such thing as will cannot have any power or opportunity of doing according to its will nor be necessitated to act contrary to its will nor be restrained from acting agreeably to it and therefore to talk of liberty or the contrary as belonging to the very will itself is not to speak good sense if we judge of sense and nonsense by the original and proper signification of words for the will itself is not an agent that has a will and the power of choosing itself has not a power of choosing that which has the power of volition or choice is the man or the soul and not the power of volition itself and he that has the liberty of doing according to his will is the agent or doer who is possessed of the will and not the will which he is possessed of we say with propriety that a bird let loose has power and liberty to fly but not that the bird's power of flying has a power and liberty of flying to be free is the property of an agent who is possessed of powers and faculties as much as to be cunning valiant bountiful or zealous but these qualities are the properties of men or persons and not the properties of properties there are two things that are contrary to this which is called liberty in common speech one is constraint the same is otherwise called force compulsion and coaction which is a person's being necessitated to do a thing contrary to his will the other is restraint which is his being hindered and not having power to do according to his will but that which has no will cannot be the subject of these things i need say the less on this head mr locke having set the same thing forth with so great clearness in his essay on the human understanding but one thing more i would observe concerning what is vulgarly called liberty namely that power and opportunity for one to do and conduct as he will or according to his choice is all that is meant by it without taking into the meaning of the word anything of the cause or original of that choice or at all considering how the person came to have such a volition whether it was caused by some external motive or internal habitual bias whether it was determined by some internal antecedent volition or whether it happened without a cause whether it was necessarily connected with something foregoing or not connected let the person come by his volition or choice how he will yet if he is able and there is nothing in the way to hinder his perusing and executing his will the man is fully and perfectly free according to the primary and common notion of freedom what has been said may be sufficient to show what is meant by liberty according to the common notions of mankind and in the usual and primary acceptation of the word 
but the word used by armenians pelagians and others who oppose the calvinists has an entirely different signification these several things belong to their notion of liberty one that it consists in a self-determining power in the will or a certain sovereignty the will has over itself and its own acts whereby it determines its own volition so as not to be dependent in its determinations on any cause without itself nor determined by anything prior to its own acts two indifference belongs to liberty in their notion of it of that the mind previous to the act of volition be in equilibrio three contingence is another thing that belongs and is essential to it not in the common acceptation of the word as that has been already explained but as opposed to all necessity or any fixed and certain connection with some previous ground of reason of its existence they suppose the essence of liberty so much to consist in these things that unless the will of man be free in this sense he has no real freedom how much soever he may be at liberty to act according to his will a moral agent is a being that is capable of those actions that have a moral quality and which can properly be denominated good or evil in a moral sense virtuous or vicious commendable or faulty to moral agency belongs a moral faculty or sense of moral good and evil or of such a thing as desert or worldliness or praise or blame reward or punishment and a capacity which an agent has of being influenced in his actions by moral inducements or motives exhibited to the view of understanding and reason to engage to a conduct agreeable to the moral faculty the sun is very excellent and beneficial in its action and influence on the earth in warming it and causing to bring forth its fruit but it is not a moral agent its action though good is not virtuous or meritorious fire that breaks out in a city and consumes great part of it is very mischievous in its operation but it is not a moral agent what it does is not faulty or sinful or deserving of any punishment the brute creatures are not moral agents the actions of some of them are very profitable and pleasant others are very hurtful yet seeing they have no moral faculty or sense of desert and do not act from choice guided by understanding or with a capacity of reasoning and reflecting but only from instinct and are not capable of being influenced by moral inducements their actions are not properly sinful or virtuous nor are they properly the subjects of any such moral treatment for what they do as moral agents are for their faults or good deeds here it may be noted that there is a circumstantial difference between the moral agency of a ruler and a subject i call it circumstantial because it lies only in the difference of moral inducements they are capable of being influenced by arising from the difference of circumstances a ruler acting in that capacity only is not capable of being influenced by a moral law and its sanctions of threatenings and promises rewards and punishments as a subject is though both may be influenced by a knowledge of moral good and evil and therefore the moral agency of the supreme being who acts only in the capacity of a ruler towards his creatures and never as a subject differs in that respect from the moral agency of created intelligent beings god's actions and particularly those he exerts as a moral governor have moral qualifications are morally good in the highest degree they are most perfectly holy and righteous and we must conceive of him as influenced in the highest degree by that which above all others is properly a moral inducement namely the moral good which he sees in such and such things and therefore he is in the most proper sense a moral agent the source of all moral ability and agency the fountain and rule of all virtue and moral good though by reason of his being supreme over all it is not possible he should be under the influence of law 
or command, promises or threatenings, rewards or punishments, counsels or warnings. The essential qualities of a moral agent are in God, in the greatest possible perfection. Such an understanding, to perceive the difference between moral good and evil, a capacity of discerning that moral worthiness and demerit by which some things are praiseworthy, others deserving of blame and punishment, and also a capacity of choice, and choice guided by understanding and a power of acting according to his choice or pleasure, and being capable of doing those things which are in the highest sense praiseworthy. And herein does very much consist that image of God, wherein he made man, which we read in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and chapters 9, verse 6, by which God distinguished man from the beasts, namely in those faculties and principles of nature, whereby he is capable of moral agency. Here in very much consists the natural image of God, as his spiritual and moral image wherein man was made at first consisted in that moral excellency that he was endowed with end of concerning the notion of liberty and of moral agency by jonathan edwards seventeen o three to seventeen fifty eight